Uh, yes. Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Royal Photographic Society's Historical Group and this latest in a series of looks at the different photography collections around the UK. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Gilly Reid, the chair of the Historical Group, who will introduce our speaker this evening. Gilly, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Well, our speaker this evening is Will Troughton uh, on the Philip Jones Griffiths collection. Uh, and he works for the National Library of Wales. And this is in particular about the magnum photographer Philip Jones Griffiths, and it will be given by Will. He was ed Will was educated at Newcastle University and later at Aberystwyth University College of Wales, which is where the National Library is. He has worked in financial services and had been a, a secondary school teacher before joining the National Library, where he has now been for 29 years. And during this time, he has written many books. These include Aberystwyth Voices, Keridig, I see I can't pronounce that, Keridigi the Old Shipwrecks, and Aberystwyth Through Time. His outside interests include old postcards and photography. I'm glad it's photography. <laughs> he, en <laughs> he enjoys running slowly, I know about that, rowing and rugby. He has competed in many sporting events, including the Reykjavik Ultramarathon and the World Coastal Rowing Championships. In his rugby career, he is proud of being trodden on by an ex-English rugby international. I must say, I'm not quite sure why about that, but there we are. I hope that giving us a talk tonight will be less dangerous than his rugby career. So over to you now, Will. Thank you, Gilly. Well, first of all, thank you for your invitation to come and talk to you this evening. The aim of the talk is to give you an insight into both Welsh photographer Philip Jones Griffiths and his archive, now in the keeping of the National Library of Wales. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Philip Jones Griffiths and his work, and rather as perhaps not. You may, may even be familiar with some of the images you're about to see, but hopefully during this talk, all of you will learn something new about one of our greatest photojournalists. And it's not moving. Just click on the... Oh, there we are. That's fine, thank it's you. It's broken up. Philip Jones Griffiths first visited the Library of Wales in 2005. You can see him here on the, on the podium, returning a year later to speak at Lens, our festival of documentary photography, the theme of which in 2006 was conflict. You can see him here with the other speakers, Alec Jenkins, David Jepp, Andy Chittuk, and Sean Meddy. By now, he had been suffering from cancer and was considering options for his extensive archive. Shown our excellent facilities, his comment was, well, this is everything that I need, but nothing that I want. And as we know, Philip sadly succumbed to cancer on the 19th of March, 2008. So if that was the case, how did his extensive archive end up in Aberystwyth? Well, we'll come to that later. I'll keep you in suspense. Extensive, the archive certainly is, as this, these views give some indication. These are some of the boxes that came from his New York apartment one of three consignments that came from different locations to arrive at the National Library of Wales. Philip Jones Griffiths is best known for his work in Vietnam, in particular his photo book, Vietnam Inc, published in 1971. It was described by Time magazine as the best work of photo reportage of war ever published. Much of this talk will be taken up by looking at this period of his life. But like all photographers who produce great work, they have had life experiences that heavily influenced the creation of their magnum opus and, of course, have had to make a living subsequently. All these aspects of his life will be considered in this talk. So in what ways did Philip's early life influence him? Well, he was born in Swithland in North Wales on the 18th of February 1936. This is Swithland High Street. His father, Joseph, managed the local London Midland and Scottish Railways freight service. His mother, Catherine, from whom the Jones was acquired, was a midwife. He was fluent in Welsh, he was educated locally, and took photography at the age of 14. And he claims that the first photograph he took was taken on a box brownie and of a friend in the rowing boat off Hollyhead. Before leaving school, he was photographing weddings and working as a photographer at the nearby Golden Sands holiday camp. After leaving school, he became an apprentice pharmacist at Boots the Chemist, nearby Shrill where he was able to borrow cameras for the weekend. It was his contention 
that between the ages of 16 and 18, he learned to take pictures. In his own words, I got all that beautiful landscape stuff out of the way in North Wales and was ready for the rest of the world. He also realised that this little brown box around his neck was his ticket out of Fithlan and into the rest of the world. Initially, the rest of the world was confined to Liverpool University, where, along with making efforts to improve his photography, such as joining the, the Leica Correspondence Circle, he was studying pharmacy. And this is one of the photographs he took during his time in, in Liverpool. I particularly like it because I think the, the teacher has a very patient expression and he looks very possessive of his children. Later, he moved to Piccadilly, where in 1959, he undertook employment as a pharmacist, in fact, a, a night pharmacist for Boots the Chemist. In London, he was able to combine pharmacy with freelance photographic assignments for the Sunday Times, the Guardian and the Observer newspapers, until eventually becoming a full-time photographer for the Observer in 1961. Many photographs from this period appear in his posthumous volume, Recollections. Growing up by in a town dominated by an English castle and subject to seasonal invasion, had instilled him a sympathy for the underdog. In the picture we saw of Fridlan, it looked very quiet, but he talks about the, the seasonal invasion of tourists and how they might have to wait for many minutes at the side of the road just to cross the road because of the amount of traffic. Combine this with a favorite uncle who was a Wesleyan minister, who was a renowned pacifist, and attendance at chapel three times every Sunday, all contributed to what we might term the evolution of his moral compass. And I can assure you, you do not sit on the unforgiving rock hard pews of a Welsh nonconformist chapel three times every Sunday without absorbing something of the message. Whereas Philip had no time for religion, what he heard in chapel, to my mind, undoubtedly influenced him. After all, one of his favorite sayings came from this uncle. You're here to make a difference, to change things, so that when you leave this world, you should leave it a better place. His attitude to life in general and to photography soon gave rise to his British work being described as a Welshman's offbeat critique of any manifestation of power. It was this cr critique that was important as as important as the shutter on his Leica and accompanied him everywhere. His first big breakthrough came here in Algeria in 1962. As the war for independence in Algeria drew to a close, there were persistent rumours of remote recruitment camps used to confine civilians whilst the surrounding countryside was napalmed. However, no photographs of these camps had yet emerged. Using his contacts, and after trekking some distance, he was able to enter and photograph one such camp. His photographs were subsequently published in a double-page spread on the Observer on 6th of May 1962. And you can see, see here the French flag, and right at the top of the picture, you can see there's a French soldier with his binoculars there behind the barbed wire, obviously looking out for any Welshman with cameras who might be poking around. In 1964 alone, he had covered 40 different stories in 13 different countries. Anything from Chinese acrobats in Ethiopia, film sets in Istanbul, horse racing and children's fashions in Moscow, an earthquake in Alaska, the Tour de France, Mongolia, electioneering in Rhode Island, Khrushchev in Budapest, and closer to home, Phyllis's baby. In 1965, his workload was in the same vein and included travel to Southwest Africa, Zambia, and Rhodesia, as well as continental Europe. By 1966, the lure of constant international travelling was waning. It was also the year that, with the help of Ian Berry, that he joined the Magnum Photo Agency. Griffiths now felt that he needed something to get passionate about and to take the photos that he wanted to take, not taking photographs at the behest of other people. With 180,000 American military personnel in Vietnam, in his words, you didn't have to be a genius in 66 to work out that there was something very important happening in Vietnam. Offered a job to photograph women working in sweatshops in Singapore, he used the flight to get him to Southeast Asia. After completion of his assignment, he flew on to Vietnam. 
this is the stub of the ticket that he used. You can see it cost him £345, which, according to the online Bank of England inflation calculator, is the equivalent of £6,752 today. Quite a tidy sum. Um, just in case you can't see it, I'll read out Russell Miller's wonderful quote from Magnum, 50 Years at the Front Line of History. America's long nightmare in Vietnam worsened considerably in 1966 with the arrival in Saigon of a garrulous and cantankerous Welshman called Philip Jones Griffiths. And I think that sums him up wonderfully. Initially, Philip traveled extensively in Vietnam and he developed an affinity with the Vietnamese people. He saw a lot of similarities between the Welsh people that he knew and the Vietnamese, both being in smaller rural village-based communities and both having a kind of imperial yoke put upon them. His, travel his travels disproved official reports to re reveal a military industrial complex at work, which was desecrating both the culture and landscape of Vietnam. Choosing likers, such as this one here, which is one of his actual likers from his period in Vietnam, and Nikon F cameras, and loaded with black and white film, he photographed the effect of the war on the ordinary Vietnamese, and to a lesser extent, combatants, especially American conscripts, who he regarded equally as victims of the war. Although his photography is likened to contemporaries Don McCullin, Tim Page, and Larry Burroughs, Griffiths was the only one to question the morality of the war. Again, in his own words, I decided to be the one who would show what was really going on in Vietnam. Here was something of profound importance to the whole world. My goal was to prevent every aspect of the war in a digestible way between two covers of a book. This was, of course, the era of the colour supplements and the colour magazines, such as Sunday Times, the Sunday Telegraph and the Observer in the UK. Philip's insistence on using black and white film put him at a commercial disadvantage when compared with his peers. This, I think, is reflected in the frustration that comes through in some of his correspondence. Let's move on to this one as well, where you can see some of the comments there. You'll note that um, Christopher Angelou there, the photographic editor of the Sunday Times, is, is questioning the level of his expensive there. It must be pointed out, this was by no means the first time that, that his level of expenses had been questioned and going back to it well before his days in, in Vietnam. I think perhaps further indication of his frustration here as well. His financial situation was alleviated in November 1967 when, on a chance visit to Cambodia, he stumbled on Jackie Kennedy and Lord Harlech in Angkor Wat. His photos appeared in publications the world over and funded his future work. He returned to Britain in late 1967, using the return part of the ticket we saw earlier, but on news of the Tet Offensive, flew back to Vietnam in early 1968. Um, during, during the period 1968 to 1973 also, he'd set up GB colour services with John Bulmer, aimed at um, providing a quality duplicating service for transparencies. Philip said at the time that they were tired of sending off transparencies to, to magazines and newspapers, and they would come back with coffee rings on the slide mounts and just generally weren't being well looked after. So they set up their own colour duplicating service, and apparently the only light they could find that was suitable was a light from a Boeing 707, which was a 650 watt tungsten halogen light bulb. So I just to think what their electricity bill was like. During this time also, Philip appeared on um, television Wales and West. He, he reviewed 30 minute theater for which he was paid 12 pounds, 12 and six. But as we can see, when hearing of the little Tet, the, the Tet Offensive, he rushed back to Vietnam. And um, you can see there he's saying towards the bottom there, that he entered on a military flight and therefore his passport wasn't stamped. So this was just uh, a way of sort of sorting out his, his status there. Originally, the book that he, he envisaged was to be called Wham Vietnam. Philip had trouble in finding a publisher with a publisher called Dan Donald Carroll, first of all, rejecting the book in October 1969. And we can see there's by now the book's called Portrait of a War. And sadly that, that this was canceled. 
Um, Rap and Whiting also cancelled it and asked for their £100 advance back. And Mitchell Beasley again showed interest, but then pulled out. The oft-cited reason well, now was on the basis that other books on the Vietnam conflict were already available, even though, of course, they were completely different from what Philip envisaged. Here, by the way, are a couple more items from the archive from around this period. These are some of his notebooks. There are many. What's interesting is that you can relate a lot of the comments to particular pages and incidents in Vietnam Inc., but he never seems to have dated anything. I don't know if this was a way of perhaps protecting his sources or, or what, but he evidently knew what was going on, but there was, there was never a date. These are various trinkets and, and things there. There's um, some Zippo lighters you can see there from American soldiers, some dog tags. But um, I think Philip goes on, I think in Vietnam and PC mentions that, that the Vietnamese were, were very good at forging this kind of souvenir. So whether they're genuine or not, who knows? The small gray capsule you can see there's a, a snake bite kit. You can see a, a light meter, more notes, and etc. from 1967 there. So there's a whole variety of things from, from this period. And there's also this letter here, which is his letter of accreditation for Magnum Photos, that you can sign, see at the bottom, signed by Elliot Irwitt. It's not very clear, but it's to Colonel Bankson. And this is to certify that Magnum Photos Incorporated employs Philip Jones Griffiths as a correspondent photographer, has authorised Philip Jones Griffiths to go to Vietnam to cover the situation there, is responsible for the actions of Philip Jones Griffiths while he's in Vietnam, including financial matters. Magnum Photos Incorporated will notify the authorities concerned as soon as Magnum Photos Incorporated cease to employ Philip Jones Griffiths. Magnum Photos Incorporated will greatly appreciate all help and assistance that Philip Jones Griffiths will get from the authorities in Vietnam for the fulfilment of his assignment. And you can see, by the way, that this has been folded. This is probably stuck in, in his pocket for weeks, if not months on end. Not to be deterred, the book containing more than 260 images was published by Collier in 1971, called, as we know, Vietnam Inc. It was a scathing indictment of American involvement in Southeast Asia, and it has been credited with influencing American public opinion and helping to shorten the war. Apart from the commercially available softback version, 200 hardback copies were printed and destined for libraries or to be distributed to opinion formers in the, in the USA, people like senators, congressmen, newspaper editors, etc. Uh, the National Library has been very fortunate that, that it was able to pick up one of these hardback copies recently. It's for Vietnam, Inc., that he is best known and forms an integral part of his archive. As we, have, hello, as we have seen, it includes correspondence with numerous publishers, his plans for the layout, and most fascinating all, contact sheets marked up with his Chinagraph pencil coloured stickers. And there's one here. Do you know it's quite a, a popular picture there, but you can see really how the situation has transpired with the American soldiers standing around the, the captured Viet Cong, who looks to be in not in considerable pain. But you can see he's chosen frame 17 there as the, the one the one with the accusatory finger in the bottom left hand corner, which is the one we're, we're most familiar with. And when you compare it with the, the other images from the scenario, you can see why he's chosen that, that particular frame. The second contact sheet that I've shown is here for a different reason. You can see he's got put the, the details of what he's done in the, the dark room there. Um, basic 35 seconds holding back face for 15 in all, 10 face only, five face and body, then gave bottom strip below extra 30 seconds. And he goes on showing exactly how he's arrived at the print that he wanted to from that particular negative. At this particular juncture, I'd like to examine two of Philip Jones Griffith's images in much greater detail. We'll start with this image here. I'm afraid that it's come out a little darker than I'd hoped on the, the PowerPoint slide, so you'll have to bear with me on one or two points. In Vietnam Inc., this image is not captioned, but it's given a double page spread on pages 156, 157. This is a part of the book that deals with the effect of the war on urban areas, such as Hue, 
was here, Saigon. The photo shows United States troops passing through District 8, once a wealthy Catholic area of the city. It was largely destroyed by US firepower during May 1968 in the battle to dislodge the North Vietnamese during the Little Tet Offensive. Initial engagement with the photograph is first with a soldier who, moving from the camp, away from the camera on the extreme left. What we can see of his face, little more than part of his right cheek, tells us he's clean shaven and youthful. The eye is then quickly drawn to the Vietnamese woman, the center of the picture. There's no interaction between them and her shoulders are inclined away from the passing soldiers to emphasize the point. The contrast between the two figures is immediately apparent. Dressed in muddied civilian clothes and a loose headcloth, she is facing the photographer, though her eyes averted away from both the camera and the passing troops. Her face carries a look of dignified resignation. She's using a shoulder pole, a symbol of Vietnamese cultural identity from which are suspended two baskets. Each basket contains domestic items, metal bowls, saucepans, and two stoves. The implied narrative is that she has rescued these from her home. The one concession to a Western lifestyle is a packet of Tide washing powder. Behind her, in the distance, amongst the ruined buildings and stunted palm trees, can be seen the Vietnamese man in shorts with a bicycle on his shoulder, which we presume has also been salvaged. On her left and right are heavily armed American troops, all with their backs to the camera, faceless, trudging rather than marching towards the unknown. They are walking on the drier, slightly elevated sides of a track, probably once a street. The woman is therefore obliged to walk along the wetter middle of the track. The soldier nearest the camera on the extreme left has a battered radio strap to his back, what appear to be flares, and is carrying a rifle pointing skywards. The model is indistinct, <coughs> but his colleague in front is carrying an M16 rifle pointing towards the ground, suggesting they're part of an infantry unit. The back of his tunic below the radio is damp, suggesting he's sweating that the climate is humid. The use of this picture by Philip Jones Griffiths is, as might be expected, very clever. He's photographed a situation which displays two cultures as complete opposites, a common theme throughout his photography. They are even shown traveling in opposite directions to emphasize this distinction. The domesticated female Vietnamese with her shoulder pole, a throwback to Vietnam's rural traditions, seems to be picking her way delicately and purposefully through the mud. Whilst the militarized and armed male soldiers carrying the latest in military technology are trudging. We can of course see her face and are therefore invited to relate to her, whereas the soldiers are presented as faceless denizens of a military machine. Is the lack of engagement between the soldiers and the woman a tacit acknowledgement of guilt on their part, on the part of the servicemen, the destruction caused in their name? <coughs> Who knows? At first, first glance, this photograph shows an American soldier with a Vietnamese girl, aged perhaps six or seven years old, sitting on his knee. Again, Philip has not captioned this in Vietnam Inc. The pair are sitting in the shelter of a building, the wooden panelling and the corner of a window visible behind them. The light source, daylight, is coming from the right of the picture. Neither one is smiling or expressing any other emotion, merely unease in front of the camera. The soldier is in combat fatigues, but bareheaded. A dark line across his forehead suggests the outline of his helmet. He's aged about 30, unshaven, with a wedding ring on his left hand and his piercing blue or gray eyes. Both he and the girl are looking straight at the camera. His age and a battered Staff Sergeant collar insignia, three chevrons with an arc underneath and his right lapel indicate that he's a career soldier rather than a conscript. The photograph is taken from slightly below their eye level. The flap of the soldier's right breast pocket is unfastened and protruding can be seen part of a photograph, slightly crumpled and hastily placed in the pocket upside down. From the visible portion, the bottom of the picture can be discerned a mouth and a chin, indicating that the photograph is a portrait. On the left arm of his tunic, directly behind the girl's left ear, can be seen the octophile insignia used by the 9th Infantry Division. 
The girl wears two earrings and sits on the soldier's knee, looking impassively at the camera. Her hands clasp together between her knees. She's wearing trousers of a cloth with a narrow striped design and a blouse on which Southeast Asian designs are visible. Philip Jones Griffith's filing system indicates the film was shot in 1967 and was the 39th story he photographed that year. In all, he shot 44 stories in 1967. Therefore, we can extrapolate that this story dates from late 1967. The background to the photo starts with the arrival of the sergeant's unit in Vietnam in February of 1967. The 9th Infantry Division was introduced in the Mekong Delta as part of Operation Coronado, an operation attempting to dismantle communist strongholds in the area, including psychological operations to win the hearts and minds of the people. Philip Jones Griffiths always had more than one camera around his neck when at work. So the scenario was also photographed on another film, 67-39-4, where it occupies three frames, but shot with a wide angle lens. And these more details apparent. The Marine has a cigarette in his right hand in the first frame and his weapon, an M79 grenade launcher is laid behind him on the floor, behind him on the floor in all three frames. Is the soldier homesick and trying to recreate the kind of relationship he has at home with his own family? Has he shown the, her the picture in his breast pocket? Is he trying to befriend her because he's under orders to do so, or is he acting on his own instincts? Is this their first encounter, or are they known to each other already? Adjacent frames show other soldiers from this unit appear to be on good terms with the community. They show soldiers inside a house. On the table can be seen U.S. Army ration packs, evidence <coughs> excuse me, perhaps of a gift or a trade. In other shots, one of the soldiers is, is sketching the inhabitants, causing much hilarity. And another, they're seen eating. In Vietnam Inc., this image occupies the whole of the right-hand page, opposite the introduction. Its placing there is symbolic and deliberate. The introduction of the book deals with the relationship between America, big, brutal, industrial, military, militarized, and Vietnam, smaller, vulnerable, agrarian, and innocent. In every sense, the two cities are opposites, male, female, powerful, powerless, old, young, worldly wise, innocent, close cropped hair, long haired, smooth skinned or unshaven. By extrapolation, you are able to see the two countries and their cultures as opposites. Griffiths uses this image to make a further point by using a contrasting image on the next page of Vietnam Inc. of a carefree and smiling young woman holding a sickle and surrounded by lush vegetation, indicating a happier, self-sufficient rural idol without interference from outside forces. In other words, he is contrasting an unhappy dependency on America against a happy, self-sufficient, independent Vietnam. Although the photo is essentially a gram shot and that the photographer has not sought to arrange the picture, the composition deserves consideration as it contains many elements of Christian imagery. In particular, there are similarities to many Madonna and child religious icons. So was this a deliberate attempt to use a composition familiar in Christian imagery in order to raise a number of questions about the Vietnam War? Obviously the sexes have been reversed. The Madonna has been replaced by a male, infant Jesus by a female. In Christianity, Madonna is the protector of the infant Jesus. In this respect, is Philip Jones Griffiths implying a partial role reversal, the soldier is there to protect the child and by infants Vietnam, or are the roles completely reversed and he's there to oppress and subjugate the child and by inference Vietnam. This is in fact the, the original of the photo. It's a, a color slide. I think it loses a lot of its impact by being in color. If you're not quite sure what I'm talking about by Christian imagery, you can see there there's Madonna and child. Oh, sorry, flick it on, I'm yeah, the wrong way. You can see the Madonna and child by Murillo there, and you can see he's sort of echoing the same kind of composition. Without wanting to labor the point too much, this is the image of a, a wounded Viet Cong and again, I think it's full of Christian imagery, apart from the, the symmetrical composition that, that we have. 
Are we looking at the baby Jesus surrounded by the three wise men? Or is this the crucified Jesus and the three Marys? Neither this, the photo of the, this nor the photo of the Marine are constructed photos, but I think they show Philip's awareness of composition. After all, one of his most famous quotes is, content alone is propaganda, form alone is wallpaper. These images use, include both content and form. This image might look sort of familiar. I think it's in Apocalypse Now where the scene is in fact re recreated. What had happened was that um, the soldiers had come across this, this Viet in, wounded Viet Cong. He in fact, he was really on his deathbed. He was holding his intestines in, in the bowl you can see in the bottom of the, the photo there that was strapped around him with a, a length of cloth. The, the Viet Cong was asking for water and the soldier's interpreter told him, oh, I'll just give him water from the paddy field there. But one of the, the soldiers had so much respect for him. One of them said, oh, he can drink out of my canteen anytime and gave him water from his own canteen. Um, this was copied by Francis Ford Coppola in um, Apocalypse Now. And apparently Philip Jones Griffiths told, asked Magnum to, to phone him because he thought maybe, no, he copied Philip Jones's photograph here and, and perhaps they ought to get some of the royalties for it. And... They did. They explained the situation to Francis Ford Coppola, who then said, sue me and put the phone down to such is life. So what about life after Vietnam Inc? Well, in 1972, probably as an antidote to Vietnam and all that he'd seen, he undertook a journey around the South Pacific, part at least in the country of Heather Holden, visiting Tahiti, Fiji, New Zealand, Indonesia and Australia. But... In early 1973, a new challenge came along. His eye for cultural collisions led him to document the first adventure club package holiday to Papua New Guinea in the Pacific. Joining up with a solicitor, Catholic priest, retired businessman, a former Yorkshire ladies golf champion and assorted others, the trip consisted of a three week trek through the wilds of one of the world's least explored and biologically diverse countries. The exoticism, as we can see, worked both ways, as his pictures document not just the primitive tribes, but also their curiosity towards the Westerners in their midst. The pictures featured in the Sunday Times magazine for 25th March 1973, and subsequently numerous other European publications. He undertook another trip to the region shortly afterwards and concentrated on photographing native tribes people in their ceremonies, such as ceremonial pig killing and a turn him head ceremony. Again, his photographs were reproduced in the Sunday Times and the magazine on the 10th of June, 1973. Whilst colour film did justice to the vibrant colours of the tropics and translated well into the numerous colour supplements, he always chose to, bring, prevent, to print his preferred images in black and white as we see in this image from the same trip, but published in Dark Odyssey. The 1970s were also the era of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And these images, again, show his eye for cultural incongruities. You can see there the soldier with his gun, I'm not quite sure what he's, he's looking for, hiding behind the bush as the lady there mows her lawn. You can see the soldier there, lying down behind his sandbags while the ladies go around their, their shopping. And so the, the last picture there of the, the little boy with the soldier and the little boy looking far more violent than the soldier. His activities post-Vietnam were varied and they included corporate work, which seems to have paid very well, and documentary photography. I'd like to examine one such article featuring his photography. With the Football World Cup in Argentina looming, the Sunday Times picture editor, Bruce Bernard, commissioned Philip and journalist Ian Jack, this is Ian Jack on the right, to visit Argentina and the Falkland Islands, the latter in the light of increasingly bellicose proclamations from the former. We all know what happened four years later. Consequently, this visit to the Falkland Islands is perhaps the only in-depth look at the islands before the irrevocable change was to come. The pair visited the islands for a fortnight in February and March 1978. Reconstruction of his films from the archive, 
shows that Philip took 36 rolls of Kodichrome film, each of 36 frames, and a further 13 films of, ecto of ectochrome. This day was a week longer than anticipated due to a, a paucity of flights. And I su suspect, but I found no evidence of it, that the films of ectochrome that he had perhaps were films that he purchased locally because he'd used up his supply anticipating only a week's stay. The subjects they covered for their, during their stay included some of the remoter settlements such as Port Louis, Darwin and Goose Green, a Cayley and a rodeo celebrating the end of the sheep shearing season. Also a funeral that took place on the 20th of February, the local defence volunteers, Hulks in the Harbour and the Globe Hotel. The article appeared in the Sunday Times magazine of August the 13th, 1978, and in all used 17 photographs by Philip Jones Griffiths. I must admit that, that I've got a sort of personal interest in this story. When I was in my teens, when, when this came out, we used to get the Sunday Times every week. My two particular hobbies were ornithology and philately, that's bird watching and stamp watching and stamp collecting, if you're not sure. The Falkland Islands had come to my attention through both of these. It was renowned for its bird life, but it's also it's renowned for the, the quality of some of uh, its stamp issues. So I knew a lot about the Falkland Islands at the time, but was fascinated to, to read this article. And in fact, the tear sheets uh, were ones I, I cut out and kept as a teenager. And when I started looking around for things, and I found them again in the folder of odds and ends that I had. Also included in this particular story was this image here. Philip Jones Griffiths labored over this and he expended nearly a whole roll of film on the shot. Personally, I think it's a, a very clever photo. I like the way it le re reads from left to right and how he's encapsulated a particularly British symbol in the red post box, along with the vulnerability of the children. At the same time, produce a very colorful and eye-catching image. In fact, um, through contact, I was able to not only just identify who the children were, but um, was in contact with the, the little girl there in the, the red and white striped dress. I actually sent this in to um, the Guardian to the, do a feature called That's Me in the, in the Picture, in, in the hope that they might publish it and also publicize the exhibition that we had at the time. But um, despite taking another picture from me of a prominent Welsh nationalist involved in a demonstration from my own personal collection, then they used that, but they never used the, this picture of the Falkland Islands, sadly. Ian Jack, who we saw earlier, has been interviewed about the trip. And he remembered having occasional success in suggesting suitable subjects for Philip to photograph. But perhaps most telling were his comments about Vietnam. And Ian Jack's own words, I'm no expert in Philip or his photographs, but my distinct memory is that Vietnam overshadowed, even killed his interest in everything else. It was Vietnam rather than the Falklands or Argentina that he was keenest to talk about. As Ian Jack intimated, Philip was enamoured with Vietnam and continued to visit another 25 times. He published two further books on Vietnam, Vietnamese, Vietnam at Peace in 2005 and Agent Orange 2003, as well as numerous articles as a result of his visits. Uh, we mentioned some of the corporate work that he did. Um, in 19... 80, he was elected president of Magnum Photo Agency, um, a role he served until 1985, coincided with the move to New York. In one of his interviews, he states that despite the acclaim he received for Vietnam Inc., he was still living like a student. Therefore, it's not difficult to see why in the early 1980s, he simultaneously embraced both fatherhood and took on corporate assignments, producing photographs for company annual reports and brochures. Um, this is one for... Rockwell International here. Um, corporate photography is corporate photography, and there was nothing that I was particularly keen to show, but this caught my eye. I'm sure Philip must have kept this because he, I, th I think the, the note from Denise in the Magnum office must have, have appealed to him. Um, if you can't read the writing, it says, Philip, here's the Rockwell book. You're on pages 24, 28, and 29, then in brackets underneath, don't all the executives look like snakes. And they seem to have embraced this sort of... Um, corporate portrait photography that, that you still see perhaps on, on billboards in the USA for, for numerous professions, whether they're 
estate agents or dentists or doctors or car salesmen. And they've always all seemed to have this sort of slightly unnerving smile on, on their faces. Philip's first foray in, into corporate work seems to be been for Illinois Tool Works in 1980. Over the next 15 years, he did corporate assignments for not just, but including Warner Communications, IBM, American Express, Crone Poulenc, Chase Manhattan, PepsiCo, Pfizer, Seagram, AT&T, Occidental Oil, Citibank, Mazda, Superhighway Electronics, whatever happened to them, and into the Inter Intercontinental Hotels Group. He also covered, amongst others, the invasion of Grenada, the liberation of Kuwait, the Ku Klux Klan, smuggling in Cambodia, water pollution in El Paso, political conventions in the USA, and guerrilla warfare in South America. The archive contains much material from this era, including comments by photographers on other photographers, which we're not going to go into here. Um, also, Philip Jones's animosity towards Martin Parr is also recorded. But these are the three books that he also did at this time. Dark Odyssey, which came out in, in 1986, Agent Orange, 2003, and Vietnamese at Peace in 2005. Um, Dark Odyssey included much of his work up until 1986. It included work from, from Vietnam, from Northern Ireland, from numerous other conflicts um, that, that he photographed. Agent Orange was about the suffering of those entirely innocent, often second and third generation Vietnamese and to lesser extent Americans who suffered birth defects due to the use of Agent Orange, which was um, a toxin. And it stayed in the ground for, as far as we know, it still does, generations. Um, and once ingested, it can cause birth defects, some quite horrific. Obviously, the, the, most of these, the victims are, are in Vietnam, but it has included the um, children and grandchildren of some of the servicemen who, who served in, in Vietnam as well. Vietnam in, in, at Peace was his third in the trilogy of books in Vietnam, and he regarded it really as being the completion of Vietnam Inc. because it shows Vietnam as a, a vibrant and peaceful country. So what of the archive itself? Well, we've seen a few of the treasures. Here's one more. I wasn't sure where to put it in, but I thought I'd just show you Philip Jones's Griff's passport. It's quite, a, quite an impressive document. There's, there aren't many blank pages in it. So extensive, in fact, was his archive that as part of our 2015 exhibition, we were able to reconstruct his shelving unit from his flat in New York. He'd obviously done some test shots. He'd been playing perhaps with new cameras or lenses and had photographed this particular shelving unit. And when we came to sort through the archive, we were actually able to find everything that, that was in the, in the photographs. There were his cassettes of Welsh music, numerous books, um, small articles of, of ephemera, um, videotapes, um, even this Chairman Mao mask. The archive as it now exists in the National Library consists of three elements. The contents of his New York flat, the contents of a storage facility in New Jersey and items from his flat in London. Material from his New York flat arrived here in 17th November, 2011 in 106 boxes supplied by the Liffey Van Lines Inc, which we saw earlier in the presentation. Its contents include approximately 177,000 color slides, approximately 6,400 silver gelatin prints, approximately 200 color prints, photographic equipment, paper documents, books and magazines, newspaper cuttings, two cine reels, ephemera and other personal belongings. I just run very quickly through the contents of one box that I chose out of a list at random, box number 24. It included pillowcases, a towel, screwdriver, empty plastic sleeves, five prints on a CIDIC card, 15 and a half by 11 and a half inches, one print, 20 by 16, New York Stock Exchange, 52 black and white prints, 11 by 14, miscellaneous subjects, 16 black and white prints, 10 by 12, miscellaneous subjects, 21 black and white prints, 10 by 12 from Agent Orange, 
16 black and white prints, 11 by 14, miscellaneous, but mainly dark odyssey. Further 18 black and white prints from Agent Orange, mainly 10 by 12. One poster of a poodle with a mohawk, one camera, four lenses, 300 slides marked Vietnam 70, 04, 75, 04, Halong Bay. That shows that it's not the 70, 04, 05 is not the date. 70 shows it's the year in which it was taken. 04, that it was the fourth story he covered in 1970. And 05, shown that it was the fifth film from the fourth story in 1970. 400 slides mark Vietnam 1980. Two slide carousels marked Vietnam Inc. 1 and 2. Two copies of Agent Orange and three mounted tear sheets. The New Jersey material arrived in National Library of Wales on 8th March 2002 and consisted of 157 boxes containing approximately 82,300 Kodak or Kodachrome slides, 700 silver gelatin prints, 400 color prints, photographic equipment, paper documents, 1,160 books, magazines, newspaper cuttings, PC equipment, including hardware, software, floppy disks, cables, etc., ephemera, and other personal belongings. It's quite fortuitous, this amir material derived from it did, as in October 2012, Superstorm Sandy hit New Jersey, causing widespread dis destruction. Finally, from his London flat, we have had 79 files of contact sheets and a number of pr framed prints from the Recollections exhibition. Now, the original agreement for the future of the archive was that it remains the property of the Philip Jones Griffiths Foundation. This is an education establishment, oh, and an educational establishment north of Aberystwyth that will remain anonymous will to provide permanent exhibition space for Philip's work with the National Library responsible for changing material over at intervals to main in, maintain interest in his work. Unfortunately, changes at the top of that particular institution resulted in the change of heart. The material now resides in Aberystwyth where it's been sorted and is stored under archival conditions. I'd like at this point, I think, to pay tribute to Avril Jones, who was my director at the time, who allowed us to, not only to have the material transported over here, but the time and the trouble to support it, and to our excellent exhibitions team, now by and large disbanded, who put on such a good exhibition in 2015. The archive now remains the property of the Philip Jones Griffiths Foundation, which was established by him in 2000. The object of the foundation is to further the education of the public in the arts and science of photography, with a particular emphasis on helping and aiding young photojournalists. The foundation has in previous years offered an award of £10,000 for documentary photography, the prize being for the production of a complete body of work. But it must be a project related to issues of social and political importance. Do have a look at the website, it's got full details and previous winners there. It was always his wish that his collection be housed in Wales and the Philip Jones Griffiths Foundation be established to preserve his archive and provide education to the public. The archive is not only an irreplaceable document of the latter half of the 20th century, but an inspiration to photographers, journalists, and documentarians of coming generations. It currently resides here and it's a valuable educational resource. It has been con consulted by a number of students, some from abroad, that was undertaking postgraduate research and a number of groups of undergraduates and school students, though sadly for obvious reasons, not recently. We're looking forward to welcoming groups of students back to the library and, if requested, members of the Royal Photographic Society. Jochen Marian, thank you very much. Thank you, Will. That was uh, a fantastic insight into Philip Jones Griffiths and his work and, and of course, the, the collection. And um, we've got various questions that have come in to me. And if I could just start, if you'll have to take a few questions, we've got yeah, certainly. a few minutes or so. Thank you. Um, so the first question is, um, did Philip have any perspective on his own legacy? I'm um, clearly the fact he's brought the archive or wanted the foundation to be established and, and the collection to be housed. What was his own view about his legacy? I think he would have liked to have had a standalone organisation which was able to offer perhaps training courses and to, to be sort of self-financing. But I think the financial situation at the time wasn't really going to p permit that, whether it'll happen in the future, I, I wouldn't like to say. Okay. 
And second question I've got here for you is, um, I mean, you've just described in in numbers the the collection and how it arrived from the three locations. Um, how do you actually go about approaching, managing, and dealing with a collection of that size, which just seems enormous and so disparate in terms of what it contains? We've gone through really. I think it was quite easy. I wouldn't say to discount the corporate work, but but that didn't receive as much attention as the rest of the work. So when it came down to it, you're you're looking at sort of material from there's some of his early material, but the slide material, from, particularly from, from Vietnam, right through to covering the stories like Kuwait or the invasion of, of Grenada, that's sort of the material that we really prioritised. And a lot of that has been rehoused. There's a lot of work still to be done on it, but, but we did what we thought was, was important at the time, and I, I'm pleased with, with what we've done. Um, the rest of the material, is, it's stored in one of our cells. We can control the temperature, the, the, the humidity, etc. So we're quite happy that it's safe, and but it would be great to work on the collection, the, to have more time to work on it. And third question I've got here is, and can you tell us a little bit about how the collection is being used and any plans for it sort of post COVID? Well, it's here, the agreement we have with the foundation is that it can be used for educational purposes. So we've welcomed numerous groups, um, postgraduate students, also um, school students, mainly A-level students, who've come to see it and I think have been quite impressed by it. And impressed by the fact, I think, someone perhaps from a similar town to, to themselves was able to do this. They always think of perhaps photography being London-based or whatever, and to, to realise that there was a Welshman who was doing this and the effect he had. So I I've, do feel sometimes that, that they go away with quite a wow, a wow factor when they've seen this. So as to whether it'll be digitised, that's between us and the foundation to do, discuss that really. Uh, there's a question here from Peter Chappell. Um, is there any reference to Philip's decision to apply to study filmmaking at the National Film School in 1972? I've seen some correspondence, but but it's not a great deal. And it's I'm afraid it's something we haven't given priority to. So yes and no, in a, in a way. We're, we're aware of it, because I think when he went out to the Pacific, I think he did do some actual cine films there, but they're not, they're not in but the archive that we hold. Thank you. Um, there's a very long um, comment. Thank you, Graham Harrison, for that um, on two aspects of the um, of Philip's archive and, and work, which I perhaps will leave the audience to, to read for themselves. And I'll share the chat with you afterwards, Will. Um, just moving back to the questions. Uh, Avajit's asking, what measures are being taken to create a digital searchable archive which would be accessible worldwide? you may have just partly answered that. Yeah, it's been expanded a little bit. Well, a lot of the material is available on um, the Philip Jones Griffiths Foundation website. And also, of course, through Magnum, a lot of his material is there. A lot of his, for want of a better phrase, his greatest hits are there. So do look at those as well. But it would be very nice, I think, to make the, for example, the contact sheets widely available. Was there? I think they're fascinating. Yeah, I think I agree. Contact sheets are so interesting to see so the evolution of how a shot evolves and you touched on it in your presentation. So thank you for doing that. Um, Holly Eilert's asking, is there, any, is there still any link between Philip's work and Magnum in terms of exhibition, sales and archiving? I think this Magnum still represent Philip Jones Griffith. So, yes, there is. Thank you. And um, Michelle Clavery is asking or saying it, it was a privilege to listen to Will's insightful commentary. So thank you, Will. Thank you. Uh, Philip Jones Griffiths was, was a hugely respected photographer in France as well. It'd be great if the foundation could reprint some of um, with his books. I agree there. I'll also, I don't know if many of you can see this. It's um, Philip Jones Griffiths. It's a biography by Johan Roberts. Um, sadly, Johan passed away about two years ago. So there's only at the moment a Welsh version of this. So I've been chasing up the publisher to find out what, what's, what might happen if there's going to be an English version. Because it's an excellent book. It's so well researched. And it would be a marvellous tribute to both Philip and Johan Roberts if, if that could be published in, in English as well, I think. I think it's a, it's a very good book. If you are well speaking, do buy a copy of it. If not, just keep an eye out for, for an English version. That's fantastic. Thank you, Will. Um, I think that's the last of our questions. Again, thank you, Graham, for your for your comments earlier on, which I'd encourage everyone to read. Um, so, Gilly, I don't know if you would like to come in here. But if not, I will say thank you so much, Will, for sharing um, your insights into the archive and the collection and Philip's work. It certainly has been insightful um, and 
it's been a privilege to listen to you share your own obviously what's clearly in-depth knowledge about, and about in, in the archive so thank you for that and I hope at some point before too long a few of us might be able to come up and uh, see the collection in person so thank you for sharing that uh, and Gilly thank yeah. you coming in but uh, yes thank you very much for that I was wondering if they had any thoughts of having another exhibition of his work I'd love to um we had there was a smaller one um a pared down version in Wrexham a couple of years ago but there, there are no plans at the moment but we do have now have a new exhibition space down in Haverford West it'd be nice to to put some of the exhibition up, up there as well yeah but please feel free to pass my email address out to anybody who wants it as well I'm more than happy to email with people Right. That's really kind. Thank you, Will. And uh, again, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gilly, for hosting this evening and for introducing Will on behalf of the, the RPS's historical group. And thank you to our audience for joining us this evening for this wonderful insight and fantastic photography, of course. So thank you, everyone. And good night. And thank you for, for attending. Thank you. Thank you.